Many Jews today feel the need for a Jewish renaissance. People are searching for a more vital and authentic mode of Jewish expression, and more than ever we need to shift not only physically, but spiritually out of exile mode. This is Torah Nation TV from Jerusalem, and we are speaking with the head of Machon Shiloh, Rabbi David Bar Chaim. Shalom, Rabbi Bar Chaim. Shalom. Many Jews stay awake on the night of Shavuot in order to learn Torah, followed by Shacharith with the sunrise. What is the origin of this practice, and is one obligated to follow it? This uh, custom began a few hundred years ago, uh, but it is important to note that at that time, some hundreds of years ago, perhaps uh, 400 years ago or so, it was uh, a practice that was common only in certain very small, limited circles. Uh, the, those circles were essentially small groups of uh, Makubalim, uh, mystics, uh, etc., who adopted this practice of staying up all night on Leil Shavuot and studying Torah. Uh, there is the well-known uh, story with reg regarding the Beth Yosef, how he once stayed up on Leil Shavuot and was reciting Mishnayot. I won't go into all the details, but we know that it began around, uh, around that period, 500, 400 years ago, but it was a, uh, not something very widespread, and, uh, and that's, that's, that's one issue. However, today it has become something uh, very widespread. In fact, uh, many people would, might believe, in fact, by looking around and seeing what people do, that it is in fact uh, obligatory, and this is certainly not not the case. If one looks in uh, all the Rishonim, it goes without saying that in the Talmud it's not mentioned in all the Rishonim. Of course, it's unknown uh, in the Tur and the Shulchan Aruch. It, this practice of staying up all night is, is also not mentioned. There's no question that it is not uh, obligatory, uh, and it is only a custom. And the question, therefore, is: uh, Is it a worthwhile and positive custom? Does it lead to uh, positive results or perhaps, uh, or perhaps not? In my view, this is a, an example, a classic example perhaps, of uh, a phenomenon that uh, began to take root uh, in, amongst the Jewish people uh, some hundreds of years ago, namely the uh, process by which the unique and uh, private practices and customs of uh, certain mystics and gr or groups of mystics began to become more and more uh, widely emulated by the mainstream, by the common man. And uh, this itself is a, is a question uh, whether, whether this is in fact a positive development because it has to be understood that not, not uh, everything that is good and uh, fitting for a, a great Torah scholar or for a mystic uh, in his unique form of uh, Avodat Hashem, not everything that is good for him is necessarily good for all. Judaism is not necessarily one size fits all. In fact, what we have to do really uh, is always examine the, the the issue from the point of view of the common man, the halakha, and also the standard practice, not just the halakha, but the, the standard common minhag, as, as most people experience and live their Judaism day, day in, day out, has to be examined first and foremost from the perspective of the, of the average person, the common man. I'll give you an example. If you go to a shul, almost any Beit Knesset that you choose nowadays, uh, on an average morning, when there is no Kriyat HaTorah, Tafilat Shaharith takes 30, perhaps 35 minutes in, in many places, in most places, I think it's fair to say, on the one hand, and you may think that's a reasonable amount of time for praying. The, the, the problem is that in that space of time, the, uh, the average Jew has a Siddur in his hand, which tells him that he has to say this and then follow it with something else, and, and X, Y, and Z. And the material that he's expected to recite and, uh, and, and uh, read is, is such that the only way to complete all of that 
uh, recommended nusach, or that recommended reading for, of the tefillah in that space of time, uh, in a minyan context at least, is by racing through it. And this is largely the result of uh, a process that took place over many generations whereby more and more things were added to the tefillah, that which, was, which became the, the standard and expected uh, tefillah shaharit of the, uh, that was given to the average Jew to understand this is what you should be saying. And this was not necessarily a wise move because the average Jew has a certain amount of time in the morning to, to daven shaharith, whether it's 30 minutes or a bit more. And after that he has to rush off to work and do whatever else he has to do. If you tell him to say, to read, to cover, let's say, 100 pages in that time, he will, he will do so. And he'll be able to do so at a certain pace. If you tell him that you have to cover 150 pages or 180 pages in that same uh, time frame, he will do that as well, but he'll have to race through and won't really have much time to uh, really internalize what he is saying. Where did all these additions come from? Many of them came from mystical circles, the practices, the, the private practices and devotions of, of uh, mystics and their students, who took upon themselves all kinds of extra things that they added to the tefillah, which is all perhaps very commendable and uh, very proper for those people if they have the time, if they're not rushed, if they have more time than the average person on their hands. That's a very wonderful thing. If one wants to add more and more prakim, shall we say, from the Tanakh, from Sefer Tilim to one's regular shaharith uh, prayer, that is very, very good indeed, very commendable, very positive. But if it results in making the tefillah something very long, and, uh, and uh, something which has to be pressed into a very small uh, amount of time, then the, result, the net result for the average Jew is not a positive one. It results in a rushed and, and uh, an unfeeling tefillah, and this is not something that we should be aiming for. And I think that what happened with regards to Lel Shavuot, staying up on, uh, at night on Shavuot, is, is actually a similar process. The custom began in, in very small circles, with very few people, the kind of people who were very, very dedicated in their Abu Hashem, in their study of Torah, people who were on a very high spiritual plane, and they apparently were able to stay awake all night and learn uh, with great devotion and not uh, spend any time during that night doing other things. As unfortunately I think we see today, many people are up supposedly to learn, but in fact they're spending quite a bit of that time uh, that evening of Lil Shavuot doing other things. And uh, this is not how the practice began. It began as a very intensive, very uh, devotional kind of Abu uh, Hashem, and these people were capable of doing so and wished to do so, and were able to follow this with Tfilat Shaharith Kewathikin, doubling with the sunrise, uh, and remaining awake for this. But if we look around today, we see, if we're honest, we see that the vast majority of people in, in any shul that you choose to visit on a uh, morning, on a Shavuot morning, uh, are falling asleep during the tefillah, already at the beginning of the tefillah, not to mention the, the later parts of the tefillah, such as reading Mechilat Ruth, for example, or the Kriyat Torah. Even well before that, even during Kriyat Shema, even during Pusukei de Zimra, people are falling asleep. Because the fact is that staying up all night is not a uh, reasonable recommendation or way of life for most people. Not once a year and not, uh, not every day of the year, not, not once a year either. It's not something that people are built and uh, designed to do. It uh, disrupts people's biological clocks. It uh, results in uh, learning at night which may or may not be productive, that depends. Uh, it certainly ruins Tefilat Shaharith for a great many people. And what it guarantees, absolutely guarantees, is that most of the day of Shavuot is lost. People after that, of course, are exhausted and collapse uh, onto their beds. And this means that the house is... Uh, the, the, the people who are now awake in the house for at least half of the day, namely the mother, the wife, and the children, are left to their own devices, abandoned by the menfolk who are sleeping it off. And, uh, and I have heard women actually complain about this fact, how they are left 
with the children and with no one to help and uh, with nothing much to do and a uh, feeling of being uh, abandoned and left out. And this also is a consideration. Yom Tov should be a time for the family being together and uh, the miswa of, of uh, Simhat Yom Tov also perhaps is uh, in some way uh, demoted by, by this practice. So I've always felt that the practice of staying up on Lel Shavuot it should in fact be uh, discouraged for the vast majority of people and only for, for those who are truly capable and truly motivated to do this and know they will be able to learn all night and then daven properly in the morning without falling asleep almost uncontrollably in a, in a way which is beyond, uh, beyond their own volition and, and uh, wishes and then having to sleep it off till, uh, till well past midday, shall we say, if not longer than that. Uh, this, this is a very topsy-turvy and uh, very dubious way to spend uh, one's hug. So it, so it has always seemed to me. And uh, that is what I recommend that most people consider, that is to say, to return to a much more normal, healthy, balanced uh, way of celebrating the hug, that is to say, to, to have a festive meal, a Sudat Yom Tov in the evening, uh, learn, learn some Torah at night, and go to sleep at a reasonable hour and get up uh, in the morning, whatever hour one wishes or is able to do. It can be for Vatikin, it can be for later. And uh, davening Vatikin is always uh, 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 recommended, it's always a good idea uh, where possible. And, uh, and then spending the day also learning Torah and uh, spending time with the family as, as we do in any other hug. This to me seems much more productive, more reasonable and uh, this is the, was, was the intention of the, of the Torah and of the Chachamim. Thank you, Rabbi Bar Chaim. We would like to encourage our viewers to share these videos with friends and send in your responses. We would also like to suggest the following opportunity to our viewers. If you identify with Rabbi Bar Chaim's message and would like to sponsor or dedicate a video interview with the Rabbi in honor or memory of a loved one, if you would like to obtain Berkon Nusach Eretz Yisrael or invite the rabbi for a speaking engagement. Please email us at office at machonshilo.org.